thank you for attending another press conference here at the office of the leader of the opposition. I guess I should start by urging the health authorities of our country, particularly at the technical level, to pay serious attention to the threat of the coronavirus. We've all seen the news of this outbreak and the rapid spread of the virus to several countries in Asia. And of recent, we've seen cases re reaching the Americas, um, Mexico, the United States of America, and now just next door, there are su suspected cases in Brazil. Um, the virus has the potential of reaching epidemic proportions. And therefore, um, we should be ready as a country to address this situation. And often with this government, if you don't, the media doesn't highlight an issue and ensure that the gravity of the situation is understood. The government just doesn't pay serious attention to the issue. It, re it deals with it in the, the issue in a perfunctory way. This issue cannot be dealt with in a perfunctory way. We have to be ready for any possibility of an outbreak here in Guyana. And knowing the minister who is very partisan and busy elsewhere, that's why I'm calling part on the, the authorities, the health authorities at the technical level to get us ready. Yesterday, we had a visit from several US congressmen, a very high level delegation um, with, with the chair of the Western Hemisphere um, Department here too um, in the Foreign Relations Subcommittee. And um, we in the People's Progressive Party and from our side, and I'm sure the whole country welcomed the visit. The visit came at a very important time. The United States of America took a position in September that the government was not complying with the Constitution. And since then, they have had to urge the government, and I think it's because of that pressure, and local pressure and pressure from other international organizations like the Commonwealth, that the Granger administration finally relented and set a date for the elections. And we have seen continued international pressure as well as local agitation to keep the administration from even delaying it further. I think that's the only reason that so we have elections, because they are mortally afraid of going to the polls. Um, so we saw this as a reinforcement of the earlier position taken by the U.S. administration, which had consistently indicated that it supports free and fair ele and peaceful elections in Ghana. And although we spoke of several other issues at the meeting with the congressmen, this was the primary message from their side. And they, I suspect by now they would have communicated this to all the actors, the major actors, in the, in the country with whom they met. Um, I, I know definitely they would, have um, they would have communicated this message to President Granger. Um, I'm pleased that he spoke about peaceful elections and free and fair elections. And now immediately we should see him reining in those people from his party who've been on the campaign trail trying to stir up hatred, um, racial hatred, and 
agitation that could lead to confusion and possibly violence on election day. And I shall come to that in a moment. But let me return to the, to the visit of the congressman. I'm, we're very happy about this. We, I think they expressed the desire of the international community and many people with whom they have met that for our country to move forward seamlessly from March 3rd, that we need these elections to be not just credible, peaceful, but not but credible, but peaceful, and that all the parties who contest the elections, once those elections are certified free and fair, that they must accept the results unequivocally. And uh, Therefore, we, we're extremely happy about this. I think it's, it's reassuring to not just the political parties who have been struggling for free and fair elections, but all Guyanese, that the international community stands with us at this critical moment and that they too want to see free and fair elections in Guyana. And it, it also belies the propaganda spread by the by APNU that somehow the United States of America favors a particular political party and, uh, and wants a particular outcome. The congressmen made it clear that they will they have no horse in the race and they will work with whomever who wins the elections. And so, so that was very, very important for us, and we're happy that they were here. Now, allow me to, to talk a bit about what our concerns surrounding the preparations for elections, because I raised this with them too. Um, uh, and even, and I, as we, we go along the path to accomplish free and fair elections, there have been huge challenges. The major ones have been and continues to be the list and the quality of the list, the integrity of the list, to ensure that all eligible voters can effectively vote on polling day. So, they have, for them to do that, they have to be in the right place. Now, to, you have seen the People's Progressive Party's position in the last few weeks, maybe a, a week now, when we discovered that what we thought was settled, now a resurgence, a surreptitious resurgence of activities that should really never have taken place. That when the revised voters list was produced, which included the PLE, plus the 6,000 name, odd names from the claims and objections, new registrants, plus the 16,000 new registrants that they claim had taken, had, had uh, done house to house registration, that there should be no change thereafter because the statutory process had been complied with. And then now we are hearing internally that 91,000 changes will be made to the voters list um, where addresses will be changed. So this is just the magnitude of the change to take place after the entire, the RVL, that's the revised voters list had been produced. Sh this should have never happened. No change should have really taken place except minor ones to the list. But you have now 91,000 addresses we heard will be changed. Now just imagine we had 365,000 transactions done through house to house registration in before it was stopped 
and they're claiming that 91,000 of the 365,000 people changed their addresses in this process. That's over 25%. That, by any standard, it's an unbelievable number. And this could lead, unless verified, it should be reversed, but if it cannot be reversed, I see the chair arguing that, oh, um, they, Mr. Lowenfield has the authority to do that. We differ on that, but even if he has the authority to effect changes to the revised voters list, not of this magnitude, not of this magnitude, and particularly just days before the production of the official list of electors. And they haven't even completed making the changes as yet. And so this must be a cause for concern for the whole country, but particularly the chair, to allow them, the staff to make 91,000 changes to the revised voters list in addresses when they made so many errors even with the inputting of the data for the cross-referencing, the fingerprinting exercise, the margin of error was over 100%. So, and a minor error here could result in the disenfranchisement of voters. So we have brought this to the attention of the people who were here to provide technical assistance to GCOM. But there is an obligation on the part of the CEO and the chair of GCOM to ensure that each of these changes are now reversible, that each of these changes are verified. And, the, and that's GCOM's responsibility and the chair's responsibility. Because if it leads to displacement, that means people will be disenfranchised. We in the People's Progressive Party, and I think, and I want to urge APNU to do the same, they should get the changes and do some field work on their own. But it is not our responsibility, neither is it APNU's responsibility or that of the PPP, to ensure that the list is uh, a list that has integrity. It is GCOM's responsibility. We will do our work, and I want to urge APNU to do work too to check the voters' list because we don't want, because of errors for anybody, even their strongholds, to be displaced. Every single voter must have the right to vote on election day and be in the right place. So I'm urging them also to check, check the list. Now, they have sent over to us uh, some 11,000 and another 58,000 today of these changes. So we had run around just around 69, 70,000 people um, that, that changes that they have made. We asked, are they, is this the extent of the change? They said, no, they're still making changes. And on the two days from now, on the 25th of January, the revised voters list, the 21 statutory days for its display, will be up and they're still making changes there. So it just shows you how confusing and we are very suspicious of everything they do because of the history of this country and recent actions. And so we're going to be very vigilant of these changes. But this should have never happened and it's the responsibility of the CEO and the chair of GCOM to ensure that these changes are verified even now on through a house-to-house -house process with the political parties so that the people are not displaced. Displacement can cause violence and disenfranchisement. And wherefore, we plan to check the 70,000 that were given to us, and we plan to check this. That's why we are going to make sure that we check it in the People's Progressive Party. We're not abdicating our responsibility, but this should not be really our responsibility. It should be GCOM's responsibility. But we are not going to allow any tampering with the list to take place, if there is any here, and it, go, and it goes on notice. We'll bring this to the attention of everyone, our findings to the public's attention, as soon as we start effecting 
these checks. So I want to say to people, we are vigilant. We have, I've had meetings with the, the advisors to GCOM, the international advisors. They understand the need. Many of them are shocked that these changes should be taking place now. But they are verifying. They assured us that they will be verify, trying to verify from GCOM why, why these changes are taking place and what system they, do they have internally to ensure that all these changes are accurate that are being made. So we will continue to look at that. The next issue has to do with the conduct of elections, polling the activities. So it's a list, and then it's the conduct of elections. And we have already um, raised several issues. Um, they, we have pointed out to partisan behavior of the ROs. Those are the 10 who are responsible for the 10 regions in the past. And we heard that they are going to hire several deputy ROs. Could be like over 100. So we have to ensure that the deputy ROs, how they fit in with the statute, governing elections, what would be their responsibilities, and how they are they selected to, because they can easily undermine the process if you have partisan deputy ROs who might be responsible for smaller areas within a region. So we are paying careful attention to the recruitment and the hiring process and placement of these deputy ROs. We have asked for random placement of polling presiding officers, so it would make sense to randomly place deputy ROs too, so that you can break up any pattern um, that one party may want to, where a party may want to, through placing people, known people at particular stations, may want to tamper with the elections. So this is crucial. And then the environment around polling day. So on polling day, the police are responsible for security. GCOM is responsible with all of its staff and the presiding officer for the integrity of the polling day activities. And the political parties then have their, their polling agents um, to look out for their in interests. So the normal thing is that you vote and then you go home. You cannot, con it's illegal to congregate around polling places on election day. It's illegal, it's an offense, electoral offense. Yet, we, but we have seen from APNU an encouragement of this sort of behavior in the past where there would mob polling stations around, particularly around, around the evening, and try to pressure um, people from, to act in a particular manner. So these mobs either do that or often they try to intimidate voters who are going to vote at, at polling places based on their perception of who they would vote for. So this has to be avoided at all costs. It would be illegal. Yet what we have seen is, and Granger talks about, he gave assurances to the congressmen that there would be no lawlessness and the elections would be peaceful, etc. But we have heard from three of his senior leaders who are campaigning now, a display of lawlessness or urging people to break the law. So at a community meeting in South Georgetown, Winston Jordan said, and when you don't vote, this is a direct quote, you make certain that at six o'clock you're hanging around. You're hanging around. If you move, it's trouble. Comrades, we got to keep we eye. We got to mobilize as soon as we done vote. Keep our eyes on this thing because we cannot afford for stuffing boxes, especially in certain areas. This is one. There's a, one of their leaders. At another meeting, Basil Williams stated, unless you go out in a determined manner, take care of our elections, protect your vote, be vigilant, protect your vote, stand up outside the ballot station, follow them, especially after the 
polls close. This is urging people to follow um, the, the GCOM officials who are moving the ballots, etc. Although the, the count would be done at a place of toll. And then at a community meeting in Kitty, Vola Lawrence said, and after six o'clock it hit, comrades, you should already have a, your bath and put on your night shift clothing. You understand what I'm saying, comrades? Load it. You understand what I'm saying, comrades? Put on your night shift clothing. I know Valda Lawrence. I know her history. When she says that, it's pregnant with meaning. It's pregnant with meaning. You know what I'm saying, comrades? The tone of it. This is not time to be caught sleeping. You must not catch it sleeping. At 6 o'clock, you return to work at the places of polling. And you will remain out there and let our staff inside know you're out there. Just let you know that everything is covered. Some people said she was, you know, the apologist. Oh, she was talking about the polling day staff. That is not involved. Any, uh, the stupidest person would know. It's not the polling day staff she was talking about or the party agents. It's coded language for mobbing polling places. And this here, so Granger assures one thing, no, nobody should break the law, no lawlessness. But this is urging people to break the law, to commit acts of lawlessness. It's not the mobs that protect polling places or protect the ballot. It is your polling agents within the polling places and GCOM and the police. Your polling agents sit there all day long from morning to night. They observe the count. When the count is done, every party leaves with a certified copy of the statement of poll. You don't need even to follow the box because you've already done the count and you have a statement of poll that is shared and signed by for all the parties. So this is coded language for, for violence and I'm, I'm, we're extremely pleased that a private sector commission has condemned it. But the, the ERC should do the same, as well as the chair of GCOM, who is responsible for the conduct of the poll, should say that this is illegal, this is inflammatory language, it's a language designed to break the law, and that, the, the, that anyone who does this sort of thing, that condign action would be taken against them. The, um, so I want to just assure people that we are paying careful attention to all of these issues. And we are extremely pleased that the international help that we were pushing for is within GCOM to look at not just the integrity of the list but polling their procedures. And we will be very, very vigilant. We are committed to being very, very vigilant now. Um, I, I saw an issue that is really, we live in a bizarre country. We live in a bizarre country. So APNU criticizes the PPP. They can be vile, and they have been vile, against every PPP leader, past and present. Accuse them of all sorts of things. Um, without any evidence, yet when you raise legitimate questions about their leaders, they go ballistic and they run, for, they, they try to evoke sympathy. First they threaten and then they seek to evoke sympathy. So let me just say we don't have a law like Thailand. In Thailand, there is a law, Les Majeste. It is, you can't criticize the king. We don't have a king. We don't have monarchy here in Guyana. We don't have such a law. Presidents, because they're not ceremonial in Guyana, their executive presidents are responsible for the day-to-day -day management. They're heads of government too, not just heads of state. 
their heads of government. And so they have to answer for their policies. They chair cabinets. They have to answer for their policies and their track record. Nobody is special and above criticism here when it's legitimate criticism. So Leslie Ramsamy wrote a letter about dishonesty, indecency, and no integrity are hallmarks of the Granger-led, not even Granger, Granger-led APNU AFC. And then they went crazy. They issued a statement, threatened the media, one media back down, and I'll come to that in a moment. But what did Leslie Ramsamy say that was so offensive? Leslie Ramsamy, in this letter, sought to examine their track record in relation to the Integrity Commission. The same people who talk about decency and has that as a slogan next to Granger's face, an integrity can't comply with the Integrity Commission rules of the country. That's legitimate. So the president, under the PPP, we started in 2020, 20, two, the year 2000, when the law was passed. Every year, the president submitted his declarations to the Integrity Commission through my entire period, and subsequent PPP leaders did so. Mr. Granger, as opposition leader, used an excuse, and now as president, in the five years he's been president, has not submitted. Now, you, this is illegal. You can go to jail for non-submission. You can, and, and pr the president is not above the law. And uh, you can, or you can be charged for false declarations. Yet, he is not submitted. It's not what he said to the integrity commission or not. And so they're making that the issue. You know, oh, he didn't say, um, I'm not going to submit. He was in contact with them. The fact remains is he is not submitted. And in his tenure in government, for the first three years, they disbanded the, the Secretariat to the Integrity Commission. That's a fact. The fact is that 23 of his 32, 33 MPs did not submit their statements to the Integrity Commission this year. That's a fact. Why can't Leslie Ramsamy or anyone in this country raise it without being, being offensive to the president? Is he God? Is he king? He has broken the law. So the next thing that Leslie Ramsamy spoke about that they got very offensive, they, they got very offended with, about the increase in UG fees despite the promises of free education. So the excuse was, oh, the president is not responsible for this. Can you, why are you criticizing him? You should not criticize him, etc. Now, I thought the same, if you make a promise of that nature, you have to ensure that the promises get fulfilled. So if UG needed to increase their fees by 35% to cover their costs, then you should have put, put in through greater subvention the, the equivalent sum to avoid any increases there. But he promised free education. Even worse, we have him on tape saying that after the graduation, <clears throat> one year, he's guaranteeing that one year after UG uh, student graduates, that he's going to find a job for them in the government. Well, find a job for them. And we're going to play that tape again over and over. That is what he said. He broke every promise. Free education, finding jobs for UG graduates. But Leslie Ramsamy must not, must not ex examine or his track record in this area because he is king. He is king. He's above criticism, King Granger. And so, Leslie Ramsamy in this letter again spoke about Durban Park, about the 600 million is missing. But look at Mr. Granger's role. 
he appointed that committee. Remember the whole issue, how it started. First, they said that Durban Park will not cost the taxpayers any money whatsoever. Remember, if we go back in history, sometimes because we have so many acts of corruption, we don't go back in history. That's how it started when they got into office. So they started collecting money from the private sector. I know of many private sector people who give them large sums of money. We believe they collected over $700 million because the government had just changed. People wanted to get into their good books. At least two persons gave them $15 million, each who told me about this. When we asked how much money they collected from the private sector, they said $28 million. So what started off as a private sector project suddenly morphed into taxpayers have to fund over a billion dollars now. And they went to parliament to collect the money, but they had no, they had not tendered for the project. They brought up bills of people, some people whose names were listed to collect money in the parliament said we don't have any money to collect from them. And they were listed for large sums of money. So there is a sordid history to this. And then the committee that was established with Rupert Rupnerine and all of them, people like Larry London and a whole gang of them, they were appointed by the Ministry of the Presidency. And he defended it. And the fact is that the Auditor General report found 600 million missing from the 1 billion of the taxpayers' money. But what they didn't really look at is the money that they collected, the hundreds of millions from the private sector that disappeared also. So this is just Leslie Ramsamy was not even mentioning the other part of it. It's not 600 million missing. It's over a billion because the money from the private sector was stolen. So he was offended by that too. Oh, they cut, you're criticizing the president unfairly. He, this was managed by, through a unit that he appointed through his office. And then they passed it over to Public Works to Sticky Finger Patterson. So, so this is the, what, a, what, a, what is it? And then the Leslie Ramsamy should go to jail for mentioning very offensive because he says that Granger's sloganeers. But everybody who listens to Granger, the media would know. You go to his, his, his meetings, it's the same old speech. Decade of development, but you don't know what it means. Green state economy, but you don't have any policies written from abroad. You know, um, they, he wants to, oh, education is the key to the future, but you took away the children's grant. You even had put VAT on education. Your UG fee went up by 35%. It's all a bunch of slogans. He does nothing apart from sloganeer. So I thought that this was fair commentary. Yet they got very offended. And they, they said to the media, but, but I, I was a little concerned about how the media felt, what the media felt, because they must have been felt intimidated to say apology to the head of state, that's Kaicho News, and, and listen to this op apology. Without reservation, we extend an unequivocal apology to the head of state, President Gravid Granger, and assure that no ill will or malice was intended in allowing the letter dishonesty, indecency, and no integrity or hallmarks of the Granger-led administration to be published. We also, where possible, will unconditionally retract the Dr. Leslie Ramson Sami authored missive and express our regret for any inconvenience or unnecessary embarrassment this publication may have caused. Now, if the Kaichor has to retract a mild letter like this because of offensive comments because of fair comments from someone. I'll, I'll, I can go up, but harder than this. Then it, it shows the extent of how they felt intimidated. And, what, and, and the, 
I, I would urge balance in the Kaichoro news too, because look at what David Hines wrote on the 12th of January. Jagdeo Aipas afro -Ghanese. This is David Hines, a man on their ticket. This is illegal. This is illegal. This is stirring up racism. This is racial hostility. None of that was in Leslie Ramsamy's letter. Leslie Ramsamy did not criticize people's religion, their gender, their race. Stayed away from all of that. This guy says, I, I pass afro ghanese because I said at Kitty Rally that the PPP is the natural home for afro ghanese because of our pro poor and pro-development policies and pro-business policies. What's wrong with me saying the PPP is the natural home and we are urging more people to join us? But that is I pass because he owns, owns afro ghanese and he speaks on behalf of all afro ghanese in the country. And he's busy hobnobbing and enjoying the good life, he and members of his family. Not a single word when vendors or people afro ghanese who lost their lands or can't find a job are displaced elsewhere the, over the last four years when they, they didn't go to him for representation. They came here. We represented them because they are our people. This is their people, our people, the people of Guyana. And I made it clear that this office will do that. But suddenly he, like Harmon, hobnobbing with the rich, rich guys, and now suddenly they need votes. So my, they, they own people and, uh, once again. So Kaichor News owes me an unequivocal apology for this. I need that apology too. This is worse. Because I know I don't I pass no Afro -Ghanese Because I say, please come and join us. This is your natural home. You know the PPP. I need that apology too. So and that is something. And and this guy in the article goes say, imagine, similar to what Harmon said. In the same article says, Dr. Jagan engaged in ethnic um, window dressing. This Harman spoke about tokenism. They sing from the hymn, same hymn book, trying to stir up racism once again because they can't talk about their track record or their plans for the future. They have none. They've been an abject failure. And so they're trying to stir up racism again. And so in that same article, talking about ethnic window dressing, it's akin to what Harman said that the ERC condemned. And, and Kaichur knew should never allow these guys to publish this sort of thing. It's stirring up racism in our country. But I hope that I'll get my apology too, like Granger got his, and if we word it similarly, I'll be, I'll be looking forward to that, that one. My, that's just one example that we get. So, I, yesterday I saw somebody did a wonderful ad, and I think, Mr. Kedar, you're, you're um, starring in that ad with, with Winston Jordan. I seen, I yes, yes. Um, I saw something on, I liked it a lot, though. Um, it, it's on, I looked at it on my, somebody WhatsApp it to me. So, I, I never, I never know this is what Jordan said, but, for people to really understand how bad we are in this country. This is an interview now, I think a couple of months ago, with Jordan. This is near 20, we're in 2020 now. And Joe was asked, how did we arrive at 18 million, Gildari? <laughs> and this is it. I am, um, um, don't know, can't tell you. I know, um, um, I can't, I, I can't, I can't quote Winston Jordan oh, the same way. Part of it, I wasn't part of the, any negotiation. I can't tell you how we arrived at 18 million signing bonus. Who negotiated it? If you would mind, I thought you were part of the Quintet. But that was before. So you don't know who negotiated? I can't tell you who negotiated the thing. I don't know, to be quite honest. You know, in fact, I thought it was a gift initially. I thought it was a gift coming to us. So here is the Minister of Finance telling this country 
that the signing bonus that they negotiated with ExxonMobil. He doesn't know who negotiated it. When Suriname negotiated something and got probably six times more benefits when you look at the bonus and other, other features of the contract, cumulatively, not the bonus itself. So this is the Minister of Finance saying that. And then he goes on to say he thinks it was a gift. Who gives you a gift and to whom? That is why I think they thought it was a gift to them, to the people, the ministers and the APNU. That is why they didn't put it in our accounts. They kept it outside of the consolidated fund for three years. That because they thought it was a gift. He said it himself on the air. Please watch this. If you, this alone should tell you what, what's the state, how they represent us Guyanese with the oil companies. Doesn't know Minister of Finance, doesn't know who negotiated this thing, the critical contract for us. And he thought 18 million was a gift to them. And that's why they didn't put it in the accounts for the country. Kept it outside the accounts. This is very telling. I didn't see that until I saw the thing going around now. Please, everybody, if you didn't watch it, please watch it. It tells you about how they represent our country. And um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about quickly is um, the, I see Annette Ferguson suing me, and I'd be ha very happy to examine where actually the Integrity Commission statement, I wouldn't get her access to it, but whether she's one of those who may, one of the 23, who did not submit the statement to the Integrity Commission. But I think she wants to muzzle me. She went, that is why they went to the court in chamber to get an injunction to stop people from saying it, is because they, of what they know will, will come out. Now, clearly, clearly, you can see the difference. There's no way, and we, we have information that we haven't released as yet as to who and what and everything else. So I'm, I'm welcoming an opportunity to deal with this matter. But, but you recall, in my case, I didn't go to seek an injunction against them talking about my house for years. They, that was the core campaign about my house and everything else. <coughs> they blew it up, they did everything else. And, but I can now account for every cent, and they have looked through my integrity commission statement. They, they have access to my bank records. They, for five years nearly, they could have checked everything. I can account for every cent of it. And I built that after several years in public office, 20 years. So APNU issued a statement when somebody said something about Granger's house. King Granger now. You can't mention even his house, too. And about affordability, he built, started building after two years in office. I'd been like nearly 15 years in public life and stuff like that. So this is how it is. So Annette, uh, Annette Ferguson wants to muzzle us so we can't talk about it on the campaign trail. And the, the APNU statement, I see a Congress play statement about how we must not um, mention anything about Granger's house and it's a security risk and everything else. That, you know, that uh, <laughs> this, is, this is King Granger can't be, be um, commented. But on the same platform, they're cussing everybody, Air Finale about his house, Everybody else, they put out even an ad that they're running on Air Finale's house. But, but you must not, you must not um, cr criticize the Granger administration about anything. I, um, I saw Mr. Granger again talking about Diamond and, and where is it? It's, he said we closed Diamond. 
Well, he doesn't understand that the factory at Diamond was closed by Mr. Hoyt. But uh, uh, the factory is closed, but I can't blame him for, for strong memory. So, so um, the thing is that the factory was closed there. It was just the cultivation at Diamond. And we said, we'll move, we offered people to go to Enmore, or, and they did not want to go. They claimed that the, the distance was too long and we paid their severance. At Wales, the people had to go and get their severance done. And there was a small number of people. And we said, we'll pay you the severance and still offer you reemployment. And many got reemployed. So, so, so it's very different. And then Nagamoto goes to Wim and says to the people, he, we closed four estates, Kanji, Rosal. Kanji and Rosal are the same places. Kanji, Rosal, and Moore, and Skelton. He forgot Wales. And that they were useless estates. And any, if anything was useless, he is. And now was, is useless. He is, not the estates. And he said they saved 10,000 jobs because of that. This guy is, uh, but uh, totally useless. Uh, that's all I can see. I'm finding, when I talk about him, I find a hard time finding the adjectives. So many things flow into my head at the same time that it, it doesn't come out. So that is important. I just thought I mentioned that, that Granger started going after the sugar estates. The fact is that they put 7,000 people out of a job in the sugar belt, another four or 5,000 who depended on sugar workers' income in their communities, like New Amsterdam and all these places, started suffering because they can't sell to the sugar workers, etc. Disposable income fell. But not only just sugar workers, thousands of miners were put on the breadline. Thousands in the forestry sector. We had a rally in Linden, and we spoke about it. If you talk to the people from Aichuni or, or, or Kwakwani who came there, they were working in the past. Now, hundreds of them, in fact, running into the thousands of them, can't find a job. We promised them that we're going to get back the markets, we're going to help them with the machinery and equipment, they're going to get more, more um, tags to cut, you know, this sort of thing to get back to work in that whole corridor from Aichuni and Kokwani area, because this government is totally neg neglected them. In the meantime, imagine now, weeks before the elections, they've just advertised to give out lands, and guess who are going to get these? Some cronies. Any land given out by the Forestry Commission now, weeks before election, we don't want to respect any of those, any, any person who, who comes in and takes these lands. These lands must be preserved for our people and to ensure that they can, like through this community, forest arrangements, etc., they can find jobs. Which we've made it clear that a lot of the land given out on the East Coast, the cronies and the East Bank, we're taking it back for housing, the 50,000 low-income households. We made that clear. And I saw another party latching on because we, we, we there on, at Anna Regina and at Linden, our presidential candidate made it clear we're going to double the old age pension because we were going to take it to about $40,000 because we believe that's one way you can get disposable income back swiftly into into the hands of people, older people will spend, we're gonna increase the cash, cash grant for, to $50,000. These are specific promises. You know, we're not going with a vague thing like decade of development, etc. Young people, we're gonna find jobs, sir, by reorienting a lot of public expenditure. So I just wanted to talk a bit uh, about those things, the specific promises. Now, now, there are two things more I wanted to do. They, the head of GNBA, who I didn't know works out of Harmon's office, he's Harmon's partner. So Mr. Leslie Sorbars, who runs the GNBA, this independent authority, or so-called independent authority, the broadcast authority, he works out of Harmon's office. He's Harmon's partner. So now everything is falling in place. So he's been cussing me out, but that's not a problem with me. I don't have a problem if he cusses me out personally, but it is his impartial acts that I have a problem with. 
And even his public comments point out that he cannot be impartial. And it, there's a big threat to media and freedom of the press here now because of this. They're targeting stations that are they're perceived to be pro-PPP. They've been targeted. We brought this already to the attention of the international community. We'll write every organization globally and point out who they are. And then the person who is in charge of um, doing the investigation is a, a Edmund Chanda, and who is an AFC person too. So they, this is, he heads the GNB, and then the person in charge of the investigation is another, an, another one of their thugs. So, so this is what he says um, in the last thing. I see DPI puts out a release from him. And they think, do not force the hand of GNB. I'm not trying to force the hand of GNB. I'm just trying for them to act impartially. So he says this, he direct quote, I want Mr. Jagdeo to understand he will not be forced, we will not be forced into action. And he's fully aware of what is required as a broadcaster because he was once a minister of information and the act was assented to by him. I don't have a problem with the act. I have a problem with the, the partisan implementation of the act in this election season. I don't have a problem with the act. He missed the bus. Totally. I'm, I have a problem with how he is doing this. So all of the other stations that they perceive to be pro apnu or the government stations, daily vilification of people, etc. But not a single word of transgression. But you can't call Granger charlatan. You can't say corruption in government. So they call, call you, call you in. You get a letter. You must not mention that. Once people don't, they stay away from people's race, they should come down hard on anyone who pushes racism or try to divide our people along the lines of religion or gender or sexual preferences or those issues. Those are offenses by law. But the other things should a fair game in campaigning. There is corruption in Apnu. What do we want to muzzle us and not talk about the corruption? We have a long list of ministers who are totally corrupt, but they don't want us to talk about that. Since when that is a violation of, of broadcast uh, laws. So that, that is it. You, if, if the parties feel aggrieved, they can sue, sue us, like, like this what Annette Ferguson. If they feel aggrieved, let them sue. But the GNBA should just ensure that people are, in this period, sensitive election period, they stay away from people's race, religion, gender, etc. That's, that's how they should approach this entire matter. So I saw Harmon defending the contract to BK, $827 million, by saying, oh, the... We had started processing the contract before, and it, we only signed it on the 2nd of January because we were processing it before. This Harmon has to be crazy. I don't understand a senior person saying such an utterly stupid thing. The fiscal law, the fiscal year ended in December um, 31st. You have no money now approved by a new budget. How can you stick a go new government with a contract of this nature? And how you, you can't start disbursing on it because it was not signed in the previous year. So what's the purpose of signing, signing the contract? This is just defending the corruption because we've exposed it. But not only one person, we just... This is BK getting 827 million, and we, we said we'd cancel this. We'd cancel it. We'd cancel it. We'd build a school at Yarra Cabra for half the price, a better quality school at half the price of, of this contract. We'd build that school there, but half, for half, less than half of the price of this contract. And, and so you, this is, this is a, the, the, what we get from a person as senior as Harmon. 
a stupid, stupid explanation like this. But I want to say to the people, the technical people who are signing this, that they're the ones who are going to get into trouble if they continue with this to, to succumb to this illegality and, and listen to illegal instructions from them. Um, I've heard they have a huge problem in the camp, you know, um, they're, they're fighting Harmon and Volder faction. And so even the collection of money now, a lot of businessmen call me and said, everybody from APNU coming for a donation. And when we say we give one side, one person, they say you shouldn't have given this person, you have to give us, we're the authorized representative. So they have a huge confusion in their camp as to who to collect money who collecting money for what, et cetera. They told, the APNU people are telling the others, don't give AFC any money, they will steal the money. Um, so you should, for those of you who have insider's information, they're just imploding. They're imploding. They don't have no message. They have no message for the electorate. They can't campaign on track record. Somebody said, oh, I, I heard at a public meeting, oh, we fixed some a couple of sea defenses here, like the sea defense dam. I found out how much money they spent there. They spent like two million Ghana dollars fixing the sea defense dam. And that's the record, or building of a couple of roads. But you have to remember, in the five years, they spent $1.1 trillion of our money. So they had to build a few roads. They had to do that because that's taxpayers' money and they, and they increase our taxes by $88 billion more a year. So, so going and campaign about how they built a few roads. What about the key issues they campaign on? Jobs. We've lost 30,000 jobs. Housing. No, they have developed no housing. They campaign on lower crime rate. We have an increase in crime rate. Improving health care. That has deteriorated. They campaign on very, very specific, the good life thing. So they're, so they're very, very in a big, big bad, in a very bad shape, and they know it. And that is why I've seen the rhetoric of violence now escalating once again. Thank you. Yes. Um, Diana has, according to a Transparency International um, ranking, shown that it has improved about 34 places since this government took office. Won't you say congratulations are in order? Well, the, the thing is that these international organizations, they feed off of the reports from the local one, local groups. So TIGI, Ghana chapter, has disappeared practically in the last five years. They are very, very active in the pre-2015 um, period. Gul Saran, who eventually was part of the APNU campaign, was central in that area. They fed a lot of the reports up to TIGI, or the Transparency International, that is the international body. So that is how these organizations work. But now, these guys have practically gone quiet, totally. But I can point out to, let me give you a chance, not a word about the government, the Granger not signing the Integrity Commission for submitting. TI International doesn't know about that, or it's never had a report from this local group. They don't have a report when every president under the PVP signed it. They don't have a report that 23 ministers this year failed to do that. What about the Patterson report? What about the 600 million? We have ministers who have money in their accounts that they can't account for up to now. So that is why this local group, not a word now. They used to, every week they used to issue a statement when the PPP was there. Oh, oh, really? A column in the Starbuck News? You look at their track record. What did they say about Granger's um, non-submission? What did they say about 23 ministers? What did they say about Patterson 9000 in his account? What did they say about the Public Procurement Commission that the cabinet illegally awarded a contract? They, what about Durban Park? Not a word. Not a word that I see. They're vague 
the vague issues now about the need for greater transparency. What did they say much about the oil contract? Look at how much exposures, the tiny bits from time to time they come in with, only when pushed by a newspaper. But they used to issue regular statements. So that is why we know the reality of life here. We know the reality of life. Not aware of the gas content in Exxon's 15 material discoveries. Um, I don't know if it is Exxon Mobil or just the government who is not being heard for the coming about it. What does your intelligence tell you? Um, I don't know myself if Exxon told them. If they, if they, they're not. This bunch, this tiny bunch that runs the, the country now. They are not curious. They are not competent, so they would not even find out about it, although it's a requirement that you know they're not competent enough to ask for it and to start planning for the use of that. And they're compromised. They're compromised. They, so in that, with the three, these three governing principles, we can get no information. A PVP government will ensure that we know all of the gas. How much gas do we have from all of the discoveries? Are we, is it big enough to have a gas sector developed, not just oil? And what, what would be the cost of probably moving it, et cetera? We made it clear from the first week we have to start talking about where the pipeline would go. And not led by Exxon, but led by the government of Guyana. What are the subsidiary industries around the power plant, the 200 megawatts power plant we build using gas? What are the subsidiary industries? Is there adequate gas to come and, and build other type of industries, the downstream industries? Those are conversations that a government must have. They, they never had it. You listen to, to ministers, they're very uninformed. Uninformed, not curious. Jordan says, he doesn't, as Minister of Finance, I don't know. I thought it was a gift. And he's happy with that. He moves along merrily, laughs a bit about it, and then moves on. That is how we manage now. Okay, finally, you said this government is a very corrupt one. In view of that, could we expect that if the PCP takes government, we can see all the, the, the this government's transactions with our majors brought out? In sure, sure. And we made a commitment to that already, but we... We hope that the media too, like what they did, the hatchet job that was done on us, because the perception of corruption under the PP, remember TI, GI is a perception index too. If Kaichor had just done the kind of job with facts that they did on us in the period running up to the elections, TI, GI, T Transparency International would have probably fed on that too. But a lot of things, for example, you know, everything on a weekly basis without checking. Let me tell you personally, I was supposed to own the Marriott. That was in the, in the newspapers. I owned the Marriott. You remember I asked Adam Harris, Adam Harris wrote that I had a dog kennel, air conditioned dog kennel and everything. I never had a dog in my life. In the Kaicho News, uh, that kind of thing. Every week was, I, I'm in the newspapers for three, four weeks running that I own some airline, an airline abroad, and, and this sort of thing. I was supposed to own mansions in Miami. Mainstream media carry this. Mainstream media. Here, you can't even get an article when we have facts about the corruption because, you know why? The media knew we will not harass them, bully them in that period. Now you have a different dispensation. So I'm not really blaming the media, but let me tell you what we'll go back to. Procurement laws. The first thing you have to rigidly, um, pro to rigidly observe the procurement laws. So they have not been complying with procurement laws. We have to then return all the administration of duty-free concession to the technical bodies, not ministers anymore. We had removed the ministers from it. Now the ministers are involved in it again. We return it to the technical bodies. The procurement law is to remove the cabinet from awarding contract that we have done. They must not award any contract. 
Then on the oil and gas side, we made it clear, at least on money received, how you will know. It would be published in the official Gazette every time you get it, because if the minister doesn't do that, then he goes to jail. So other information, for example, I think there must be, we have to strengthen the Freedom of Information Act to ensure that people can, when they request any, something, that they can get it. Right? E e easily. More for public information. I've seen in some countries the way they, where they strengthen um, like provisions. I saw today about email. That your official email where you have to conduct business through. You remember the Hillary Clinton issue there. That official accounts should be accessed and stuff like that. We have to think through those issues. We already said we will pass campaign finance laws. So you ensure that the big companies, the oil companies, don't interfere with our politics. There are lots of things that we, we said we we'd, we'd go back to that they have dismantled. Dismantled. The Integrity Commission, for example, that they have dismantled. So these are just some things, yes, you can expect a different arrangement. We will never privatize anything without the public knowing. We, as I, up till last week, I pointed out, from 1992 to 2011, every single thing privatized, we published. We have a book which, which we published. Every single asset that passed through the privatization unit. Not just to whom, but what process we use and what the price was. And you can, and you can go and get that now. You asked from 2015 about all the things they privatized. Whom, we don't know to whom, at what price, and what process they've used, utilized. So these are all very important, um, very important issues that you have to resume. But I, and I hope that we'll get the same fair shake from the media, where they would call us without publishing a rumor, because it would be a free environment for the media, and we don't want to return to the rumor base kind of thing. No, 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 but not just coalition transaction, any, any transaction. Okay. Uh, we, we made it clear, like in renegotiating contracts, not just those that are signed by Trotman, but even those that were signed under the PPP. They have to all, they have to all to meet now the new um, model contract. They all have to meet the requirements. You're welcome. You, uh, did you see, they, they said not review. They quoted local. Uh, the oil now said they will not be re reviewing. I saw something on oil now. So every contract is, we've made it clear from the very beginning. The position is in uh, the public domain. Every contract has to be reviewed. We believe that the Exxon one without renegotiation that we can get more from better contract administration through uh, several areas we pointed out. We've discussed this. That every, every other contract, because you have contracts that are signed after ExxonMobil that got better terms than even the Exxon contract. And that every production contract going forward will face, we renegotiated. We made that clear. And so what he said is nothing inconsistent with our position. And I think he put on the Facebook page, he just reiterated it, his position. So, but the, uh, I wonder who owns the oil now? I heard it's this Len Leonard something. Classic. Not you, Leonard. What's the other one? <laughs> Michael Leonard from the DPI guy, right? The DPI guy and yeah. AFC candidate. Um, Yes, thank you. All right, you, you want to? Yes, sure. Yes, please. Do you know that um, not only the oil contracts, but you had oil contracts? I think Russell today they just break in the descent of a couple of people. You have gold fields, I think, the Troy and so on. Our natural resources, is there any plans by the PPP government to do 
to look back at what Guyan is getting as against the, all the benefits, the concessions that we give, fiscal and otherwise, sure. to what we receive. Because at the end of the day, Guyan was going to What are your plans? So, so, Leonard, I, last week I pointed out that when in 2015 Jordan passed his budget, remember the first budget speech, he said 55 billion of tax remissions the PPP had given tax concessions to friends and family. That has grown now to $134 billion. From 55 to $134 billion in duty-free concessions they've given. And he criticized the PPP for giving $55 billion. In the meantime, he's taken more from Guyanese. Our taxes have gone up by $88 billion more per year and they have increased the concessions to the, the business from 55 to 134 billion. So people need to do the comparatives there. Now there are concessions you have to give for production, not foreign producers alone, but local people. You can't tar charge VAT on exports. We want our people to produce an export. This government put a VAT on export. You can't charge VAT on inputs because then you have a cascading of the tax. If you pay the VAT on input and then you have to pay it on output too, then you're taxing people twice. We have to support production. Our tax system must support welfare so people have more money in their pocket as well as production. So whatever is necessary to do production. Now there are some areas that you have to give a bit more because of international markets too. So, like the international market in the bauxite sector is very, very competitive. And because of our logistics, remember we don't have a deep water harbor. So the cost of freight from Guyana is higher than, say, from Guinea or one of the other countries producing bauxite that are closer to the surface. So you have to look at each of those things. But the key thing is to keep our people working and earning and getting, a, you know, and making sure we get a fair share of the, the deal. We've definitely not gotten that in the oil and gas sector and we'll fix that. So the contracts are all with GRA. They were never kept with by a politician. For example, every contract signed in the oil and gas sector was with Mr. Dennison from, from the GGMC, who is now the head, head of the GGMC. He had it because he was heading the petroleum department. They can find all the contracts there. Every contract signed by the PPP that had duty-free concession was kept at the GRA, not by a minister. So the by Shanlin contract and everything else, they all had it at GRA. So I, this is not like their secret contracts because when they are at the GRA, hundreds of people will have access to it. And the same thing GGMC. But at that time, the media didn't ask for specific contracts. I hope that you two will ask like, for these specific contracts. The, when you're negotiating, it's a little bit more difficult to give out the negotiating positions because you don't want to harm your negotiating position. But once, let me make one commitment. Once the contracts have been signed, the public has a right to know. It's their assets. They have a right to know, and we will respect that right to know. Yes, yeah, definitely. Constantly look at, at whether it is working. So right now, I believe we got to, not to take away from our miners, we got to give them more help. We got to get 20,000 local miners back to work. So how would we help them? By reversing some of the tax increases, by fixing the infrastructure, etc. Because we need to put people back to work. Th thank you.